so we don't have state archives, right? So uh, uh, we don't have a Palestinian state archive. We don't have a Palestinian state, right? So the archives are just as dispersed as Palestinians themselves. And also a lot of uh, material, actually entire libraries, were looted um, in 1948. So some Palestinian archival material can today be found in Israeli state archives, and this is looted material. Welcome to This Is Not a Watermelon. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today we are um, joined by Sonia Meichir Atasi, who is a professor of Arabic and comparative literature at the American University of Beirut, just up the street. Sonia, welcome to the studio. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's really nice to uh, see you here and to see Africa's offices. Yeah, it's great. I should say that today is July 10th. Um, because this series is all about Palestine, um, I think it's important to mention the date just because it's going to come out later. Um, I came across this book uh, because I attended a, a conference just up the road at the Orient Institute where you were talking a little bit about this book. Um, and the name of the book is An Impossible Friendship, a gr Group Portrait, Jerusalem Before and After 1948. And maybe a good place to start is um, maybe let's just introduce these five people who are on the cover, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about why you wrote this book, and then I want to talk about the Jerusalem Hotel. Sure, great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let me introduce you to my famous five. Uh, so they're a group of five um, friends. Uh, when they met in Jerusalem in the early 40s, they were all aspiring artists, writers, and intellectuals. I focus on these five because, um, th first of all, they were very close, and uh, also because I found a photograph. Um, actually, Walid Khalidi uh, gave it to me when I told him that I'm you know, thinking about doing a book about this group of friends. He told me he pulled out an album um, with um, old photographs and told me, look, here they are Amazing. sitting together. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk more about Walid Khalidi in a second. He is one of them. So three men, two women. Uh, the man, as I said, one of them is uh, Walid Khalidi. The other two are Jabra Ibrahim Jabra and Wolfgang Hildesheimer. And then the two women are Sally Kassab and Rasha Salam. So the picture that I used for the book cover, you see them sitting together on the premises of the Arab College in Jerusalem. The Arab College was the highest uh, Palestinian uh, uh, educational institution in Palestine. And uh, Walid's father, Ahmad Sami al-Khalidi, he was the principal um, of the college. So the Khalidis used to live on the premises of the college, and very often Walid would invite his friends um, to come over. In the group picture, you see in the middle, in the center really of the picture, is Wolfgang Hildesheimer. And that's maybe a bit surprising mm. uh, because certainly in the Arab world, he's not, um, he's not well known. In Germany, actually, he is very well known because uh, he became well known later after World War II um, uh, as part of German language literature. Um, at the time, he um, was like the others, an aspiring artist and writer. He had come to Palestine with his parents in 1933 from Germany when the Nazis came to power. So he's of German Jewish uh, background. And at first, when he came with his parents in, in, in the 30s, he was really introduced to German Zionist circles in Palestine. Um, his parents um, had, uh, um, how do you say, 
strong connections in, in Zionist circles. They were themselves um, committed Zionists. Um, but he later actually developed an anti-Zionist stance. So he went, he left Palestine in 37 to study in London, but then came back because of the outbreak of World War II in 39. And when he came back, he really took a distance from these German Zionist circles and moved increasingly in British and in Palestinian Arab circles. And this is uh, probably in the fall of 1943 when he met Walid Khalidi and when he met Jabra Ibrahim Jabra, and they became very close friends. Now, Jabra Ibrahim Jabra is, um, and you see him in the group mm -hmm. uh, portrait sitting on the far right, he is today very well known as a Palestinian uh, author. Um, he is of um, a Syriac uh, background. He was born in the region of Adana and came to Palestine with his parents probably at a very young age, uh, two, three years old, um, as a refugee after the Franco-Turkish War in 1922. And then it's really through education that he experienced a lot of social mobility. He was admitted to the Arab College in Jerusalem, and then later um, he obtained scholarships to study at Exeter and Cambridge in the UK. And it was when he came back from Cambridge in 43, as I said, that he probably met uh, Wolfgang Walid, uh, he may have met him already through Walid's father, Ahmad Sameh, mm. uh, at, at an earlier stage. Um, and the two women, um, so Sally Kassab um, is, um, her father was Lebanese, uh, her mother Palestinian, uh, uh, from the Hanania family, and she grew up mainly with her mother in, in Palestine and in England. Rasha Salam is from the Salam family, which is a very well-known Lebanese uh, family, which played an important role in, in politics, and which at the time was very um, much in favor of... Um, Arab nationalism and women's emancipation. Her sister, Anbara, is very well known because her memoirs were published in Arabic as well as in English. Um, Anbara and Rasha, there's almost like a 20 years age difference. So Anbara was almost like Rasha's mother. Yeah. And Anbara was married to Walid's father. So he married a second time. Uh, and uh, um, that time he married uh, Anbara. So Rasha would come to Jerusalem often to visit her older sister. And this is how she got to know Walid, whom she later married, oh. and also how she got to know this group of friends. So did uh, when you were speaking to Walid and he uh, gave you this photo, yeah. who, um, you know, was associated with AUB for, for decades. Um, did he say, oh, yes, we are actually this famous five. Mm -hmm. We were a unit of five. Or was it like this photo was taken on? It could have been any group of people in Noam. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was uh, a sixth or a seventh or an eighth. Uh, no, no, no. They were, they were really very close. And in the book also, for example, I quote from uh, Russia's unpublished memoirs, which Walid Khalidi kindly gave me to read. And in her memoirs also, she uh, writes about how close they were. And they used to meet, as I said, regularly um, um, at the Khalidi's house um, on the premises of the Arab College, but also in many other places. And really, one of their, if you want, most favorite places to meet was above the King David Hotel. So um, they used to go there regularly. And um, uh, yeah, my book, I actually open it with, uh, so my book opens with a prologue, which is all about the bombing of the King David Hotel by the Ergon. And uh, this group of friends came together for the last time um, 
I think a day or two before this bombing. Yeah. So as I say in the book, it's it's really symbolically speaking that bombing, that terrorist attack, that um, made the friendship impossible. But in Jerusalem, despite their different backgrounds and you know here also in terms of religious uh, 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 backgrounds right so here we have it's really a coming together of Christian Jewish and Muslim friends Um, none of them was really religious right but certainly religion for all of them played an important role as part of their cultural background sure um so yeah let's let's talk about that bombing right so um july 1946 right yes so july 22nd of july 1946 the king david hotel is bombed by um a coalition of terrorists um and in that moment as you said that's the moment that these five their friendship becomes impossible and the state of Israel becomes possible. That's kind of this like, some some would argue, I would argue that that's this mm-hmm. like very important pivot point um, when the British begin to change uh, change their stance. Um, but you tell me in your in your reading, uh, yeah, tell us the story of, of that bombing and the story of that hotel. Why why it was significant. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so um, maybe first of all, yeah. to um, you said the state of Israel became possible. Um, the state of Israel certainly became possible, if you want, much earlier, namely with the Balfour Declaration, yeah. right? So, um, and the Sykes-Picot Agreement, so 1916 and uh, 17. But certainly towards the end of World War II, when Jewish terrorism um, uh, increased, so there were a series of terrorist attacks, this was a turning, another, we can say, turning point, and when things really became uh, violent, uh, very violent. Um, so symbolically speaking, as I said, this is kind of um, where that friendship came to an end. But certainly my argument in the book is that the friendship never completely came to an end, right? Despite the political obstacles um, and that inscribed in that impossibility is the possibility of friendship. So it's, it's, it's even part of the very word impossible. So um, there is the possibility remains inscribed and actually the second part of my book. So then the first part, the prologue is about the bombing. Then the first part goes back in time And here I try to reconstruct in fragments what brought the friends together, but also to shed light on their different social, religious backgrounds. Uh, The second part is then where I look at what happened to their friendship after 48, right? So different attempts at um, connecting, reconnecting, staying in touch, mainly actually through correspondence. Maybe we can talk about this later. So to come back um, to the bombing, um, this was a bombing, I think, that uh, really shocked people at the time, and not only in Jerusalem, but really across Palestine and possibly also across the world, right? Because we had not seen such terrorist attacks in Palestine before. So this was, this kind of violence was something new, certainly in the 30s with the Great Revolt, Um, The British were actually very, very brutal in suppressing that revolt. But 
this kind of terrorism that we see emerge in the really towards the end of World War II, I think it started really in 44, and then certainly with the bombing of the King David reached like a, a high point. Um, that was something new, and it really sent shockwaves, I think, across Palestine and across, um, across the region. Now, the King David Hotel was really modeled after other luxurious hotels in the region, especially in Egypt the Shepherds, the Mena Hotel, and so on. So it was the first, I think, five-star hotel um, in, in Jerusalem. Um, and it's opening, I think, in, I forgot now, 32, 33, I think it opened, was a very big event. Um, certainly it attracted um, an elite, right? And this group of friends also, despite some differences in their social background, were part of the social and the intellectual elite. Um, but yeah, it attracted, so especially the bar at the King David Hotel, many people would meet there uh, uh, for drinks. Uh, so really different people would come together who, who there. Who owned this hotel? Uh, the hotel was owned by, I think it's, a, I have to look it up in yeah. my own book. <laughs> I think it's a Musiri family. Okay. I, it's, uh, it was an Egyptian Jewish family okay. that owns the hotel. Um, yeah. Um, so let's go, let's go to the actual attack. Okay. Um, who... Walk us through who did it, why that that location was targeted, what what that was. Um, uh, it was coordinated with other attacks. Uh, yeah. Walk us through it. So so um, yeah. So so the King David Hotel really became a target because the British mandate uh, moved its headquarters into the King David Hotel. So the upper floors were used as offices for the British mandate. So um, this terrorist attack was really aimed at the British, right? Yeah. But the victims of this terrorist attack were um, many civilians as well, right? And among the civilians, uh, were Palestinian Arabs, and among the civilians were also Jewish immigrants. So um, all in all, I think it was 91 who were, about 90 who, who, who were killed in this uh, terrorist attack. So, and as I said, it was, um, it was uh, committed, uh, it was carried out by um, the Irgun, which was a radical uh, offshoot of the Haganah. So um, starting in 44, really, um, you had an increasing number of terrorist attacks carried out by the Irgun and also by the Lehi, the Stern Gang, which was another um, uh, uh, radical offshoot of the Haganah. So at the time, so somebody hearing this with fresh ears who has grown up on a media diet of CNN and BBC, mm. when they hear a terrorist attack in Palestine or a terrorist attack in Jerusalem, the idea that this would be um, what would later be Israeli forces, that the idea that these um, immigrant mm. terrorist groups um, that are advocating for Israel would be doing terrorist attacks would sound f foreign to their ears. Like that, for so many of them, that doesn't compute. If I go back to the 1940s and I was talking to people, would it have been the opposite? Would European newsreaders at the time say, oh, oh my God, another terrorist attack in Jerusalem? These, that Stern gang just will not let up. That, you know, uh, the Haganah just keeps on terrorizing, ter terrorizing us. Was, it, was that the norm? Did people... 
did it make its way into European and American media? Mm -hmm. It was certainly reported in European and American media, but I think at the time, unfortunately, similar to today, um, people in Europe did not care that much about what was happening in Palestine. And also, especially in Europe, they were preoccupied with other things, right? I mean, as I said, these terrorist attacks carried out by mainly the Ergon and the Lehi, later also by the Haganah, really started um, in, I think, 44. So as a result also of the Biltmore Conference, which took place in New York, which was a turning point for the Zionist movement, where it became clear that there was a trend um, uh, among in that movement to do, to, 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 to attempt to do everything to get a state at any cost, right? And um, even if that would mean uh, war, uh, not only with Palestinian Arabs, but with the entire Arab world. So um, that trend uh, really gained the upper hand uh, um, with the Biltmore Conference. Um, so these Jewish terrorist attacks became more common really as of 44, I think between 44 and then uh, 48, there were many, many such um, terrorist attacks. Um, and some of those were covered in the international press, but um, people, I think, especially in Europe and probably also in the US, were preoccupied with other things. So I don't think they did get more attention. Yeah. But I agree that today many people don't even know about it, yeah. right? Because that's not part of the, you know, uh, I mean, that's not oft very often, you know, uh, Israel is, or Israeli history is kind of represented in a way that everything started in 48, right? Yeah. And um, there's really a battle about different narratives of what happened not only in 48, but also prior to 48. So yeah. uh, for me also, this is why it was very important for me to, to look into that history and to research it and to document it. So in a situation like this, the reason why I said that, um, and I, I'm, I'm misinformed in so many, in a countless number of ways, so this might be one of them. But the reason why I said that this was a moment that made Israel possible, obviously there's, there's countless other mm. moments and documents and, uh, and letters and promises and uh, uh, conferences that uh, created the way. Um, I remember reading at one point that uh, the reason why the, uh, the King David Hotel was targeted, and uh, again, I might be wrong about this, but the reason why the King David Hotel was targeted was because there was some correspondence um, that some documentation in the hotel that um, the British, there were some British officers that had agreed to saying, well, you know, maybe we need to change our position on this, um, on, on Balfour, on Palestine and uh, the promises made to uh, European Jews and to Palestinians. Um, is there is there any merit to that? Uh, to what I've <laughs> what I've previously heard. So um, yeah. So to answer that question, so that takes us back to Operation Agatha, yeah. um, which where the 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 British uh, uh, really cracked down on the Jewish agency. And um, uh, because of the increase of terrorist attacks and so on, and um, uh, actually arrested some of its leaders, and they did take documents. So some of those documents probably were then yeah. stored, housed uh, in 
the offices of the British Mandate in the King David Hotel. Yeah. But I really don't think that this was a motivation for the bombing. I think it was really that the King David Hotel was such a symbolic tar target yeah. because it was the headquarters. I mean, yeah. if you want to send a message, what stronger message do you want to send, right? Yeah. Um, so I think this is really why the King David Hotel became a target. Yeah. So, because symbolically speaking, this was like you know you're 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 attacking London directly, right? What's crazy? So it about was it. the closest. Sorry, maybe the closest you could get to attacking London directly. What's absurd about it is that it's a direct attack at London, mm -hmm. and the response is, "Okay, now we love you." <laughs> <laughs> this is the absurdity of it. Yeah, it's a direct attack at London, um, wrecking havoc over uh, territory that they have uh, said that they want to control, mm. um, and the response isn't more punitive measures, isn't more uh, a crackdown on terrorism, um, but instead. Uh, you know, carte blanche. It's, it's so absurd. You're right. You're right. I mean, um, you're right, because from the King David Hotel then bombing to um, then the, the transfer to the UN and then the UN partition plan, it's, it's only a year. So things did go really fast after that. Yes, it's you're right. It's so bizarre. Um, yeah. yeah, but I think we have to be also cl clear about that things were kind of decided even earlier, right? Yeah. So uh, with the Balfour Declaration already, with turning uh, Palestine into a British mandate, hmm. and as Rashid Khalidi uh, in a number of his books points out, um, I mean, Palestine was treated differently from other mandates, right? So Palestinians were never prepared for independence in a similar way, say, that Iraqis were. Not that, you know, the British mandate was that much better in other places. I think it was wrong, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, in, in, in uh, across the region. But um, uh, from the beginning, really, uh, Palestine was treated differently because of the Balfour Declaration. Let's talk about the friendship a little more. Okay, okay. great. After 1948, um, it seems as though the only friendship that's an impossibility is the friendship with Wolfgang. And the other four could still be friends. Um, is that what actually happened? Um, yes and no. It's not what actually happened. On the contrary, I mean, first of all, there are different obstacles. I mean, Wolfgang, why, why should friendship be an obstacle? Because he's Jewish. He was anti-Zionist, right? Even after forty-eight. Um, yes, I okay. mean, um, you know, uh, we have to keep in mind that these are real people, right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes I felt like, wow, this is, you know, their friendship. It's such a good story. I wish I could write a novel, you know, yeah. and I think actually the story would deserve a novel or a film or something. But um, even though I, I borrow from storytelling, I tried to document everything really carefully and did a lot of, you know, archival research, uh, interviews, and so on. And I think we have to really keep in mind these are real people. And real people are not necessarily this or that. They are not mm -hmm. that, you know, it's not that easy to categorize people. And often also uh, people, you know, uh, th their contradictions, messy contradictions, right? So Wolfgang, um, 
you know, he so he comes from a family that has a long history also with Zionism, also parts of his family uh, were critical, very critical of political Zionism. And he says that or even his father, who identified as kind of an a religious Zionist, um, never thought about, uh, uh, always thought about uh, going to Palestine in terms of having a national home, but um, not, um, you know, not in terms of the creation of the state of Israel. Um, so, but Wolfgang, as I said, took a different, distance from these German Zionist circles, which are also not just one block, but they are different, you know, uh, different um, um, uh, di directions, different movements within uh, Zionism, right? Um, so he became more critical later on in life. So when you see, so, so, he he wrote a lot of letters, uh, almost a letter each week to his parents. So and in some of these letters, actually, he is very critical um, of Israel and really worried also what this new country, what society in Israel is 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 turning into, right? Uh, because it is lacking, as he points out to his. Uh, parents uh, diversity he never lived in Israel I mean he Wolfgang left Palestine in 1946 actually he left shortly before the bombing wow. so uh, he was already in Europe he left I think in in July early July uh, 46 to London and then it was in London he tried to establish himself as a graphic artist um, had financial problems, found a job translating uh, as a translator with the American embassy. And then it is with the allies, actually, that he came back to Germany and worked as an interpreter in the Nuremberg trials. And this is the first time he really came face to face, if you want, with the Holocaust. He had certainly um, heard about the Holocaust. Uh, when he was in Jerusalem, but it was, you know, far away and people had only very fragmentary knowledge of what was happening uh, really in Europe and in Germany at the time. So it was when he came back to Germany with the Allies working as an interpreter that he really came face to face with um, this uh, uh, catastrophe and and these crimes um, and um, uh, he then decided to stay in Germany um, until I think the late 50s when he left uh, to live in Switzerland and partly he left Germany in the late 50s because he felt that there's still you know, too many Nazis around, right? So it's it's very interesting to see, and I said, these are real people, right? So real people change, which also can give us some hope for today that people change, right? So change is possible. So for example, in 1967, we see Wolfgang, similar to other European intellectuals uh, on the left, Sing Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir. So Wolfgang, who also liked Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, was actually with the Algerian War for Independence in 1967. He sides with Israel, mm. right? So really, 1967, we see the France in worlds apart. But then later, in the 80s, we see him again become more critical of Israel. And I think this has to do with um, the Lebanese civil war, with uh, the Israeli uh, invasion 
and siege of Beirut, 1982, Sabra and Shatila massacres, and then later in the 80s also with the first Intifada. So I think, um, and here we see in the 80s, Rasha Salam Khalidi started a correspondence with Wolfgang, and in that correspondence actually, he um, voices criticism vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel. And even before, um, we see some critical, uh, uh, it's not, you know, he doesn't come out publicly to criticize Israel, but you see that in private, he remained critical or he became again more critical against the background of these political uh, events. So I think this is also important to keep in mind. So first of all, these are real people and people change. And then that we also have to kind of look at their political positions against uh, the uh, political circumstances yeah. against what is happening in the region. Um, Wolfgang only returned twice uh, to Israel, to, to what became Israel. Yeah. So he visited uh, for a first time in 52 to see his parents. And then he wrote a travelogue about this visit. And in this travelogue also, we can read some criticism between the lines. So, yeah, so to come back to Wolfgang, um, what's very interesting, as I said, 46, he leaves uh, Palestine. Then in his correspondence with his parents in 48, he's really worried about being left without a passport. And it's very interesting also to see that he was actually left without a valid passport for, I think, four years until mm. 52. So he did not want to take an Israeli passport. Anyway, he didn't live, he left already Palestine yeah. in 46. So when Israel became when, when the state of Israel was uh, established, he was already back in Europe. And he always felt very strongly that his place is in Europe, right? And not in Palestine. So, and then he tried, after 48, his, he had a Palestinian passport, which was issued by the British. So after 48, like his Palestinian friends, actually, he was, his passport, was not valid anymore, so he was left without a passport. So um, he actually joined, there was a movement in uh, France and in uh, Germany of um, uh, uh, to have become a world citizen. He, he joined that movement. He tried to obtain a British passport. Um, he eventually obtained a German passport, but it took uh, four years yeah. and it is then when he had his new passport and he was also he married a German painter that he went with his uh, wife to visit Jerusalem and his then he saw his parents again and his sister who had remained and who had become Israelis yeah how did the others in the in that time feel about B feel about him and feel about yeah so um did it feel like a betrayal uh no i don't think um there was a feeling of betrayal because he was known as anti-zionist yeah and he did not um he he he, he left palestine as i said already in 46 and he did not become an israeli and um so after 48, there were some attempts at staying in touch. So Jabra, for example, who had left um, Palestine for Iraq in 48, um, so his family had to flee Jerusalem to Bethlehem due to also uh, 
Jewish terrorist attacks um, before the creation of the State of Israel. So in, in January uh, 48, actually the Haganah blew up the Semiramis Hotel um, in Katamun, uh, the neighborhood where Jabra and his family lived. Uh, so the family fled uh, uh, to Bethlehem, and he was left without an income. So um, uh, it was really to to to, to make a living uh, that he left then uh, to look for a job. He also tried to he applied also to. Um, uh, AUB, but uh, there was no position available. And then it was, I think, at the Iraqi embassy in Damascus, uh, they offered him a job in Baghdad. So he uh, moved to Baghdad and actually later played a very important role in Baghdad's cultural life. And then from Baghdad, he um, applied to the Rockefeller Foundation to, and he got a scholarship to um, go for a year to Harvard. So 51, 52, he spent at Harvard, and he was thinking to continue his studies to a PhD. And from Harvard, he, he wrote a letter to Wolfgang in Germany, which I found in the archives in oh. Germany. And in this letter, it's a beautiful letter, he tells Wolfgang what happened to him, that he almost became a refugee in 1948, that he later moved to Baghdad, that he married um, an Iraqi uh, woman, that he's now uh, studying um, at Harvard, and so on. Uh, I don't know if Jabra ever received uh, an answer from Wolfgang. Um, uh, I didn't find anything, any further correspondence between the two. Um, maybe here we have to say also something about the situation of archives. So uh, Wolfgang's papers are very well preserved um, at the Academy of Arts in Berlin, whereas all the other subjects in my book, most of them, um, so we don't have state archives, right? So uh, uh, we don't have a Palestinian state archive. We don't have a Palestinian state, right? So the archives are just as dispersed as Palestinians themselves. And also a lot of uh, material, actually entire libraries, were looted um, in 1948. So some... Palestinian archival material can today be found in Israeli state archives, and this is looted material. Um, and a lot also was destroyed and lost, and uh, Jabra's personal papers um, were, uh, so Jabra passed away in Baghdad in uh, the 90s, um, in 94, um, but his house remained more or less intact until 2010. So the aftermath of the Iraq war, his house actually became a target of uh, another, if you want, um, bombing and was completely destroyed. Oh so even if he received a letter and had preserved it, that letter... Uh, um, uh, is now lost. So there were some t some attempts at staying in touch. Actually, the Khalidis and Wolfgang did see each other again after 1948. Uh, Walid Khalidi and Rasha Salam visited Wolfgang in Germany. Um, and uh, Wolfgang also later visited them in Oxford. So Walid and Rasha had moved uh, also in 1946, later that summer, uh, after the bombing of the King David, uh, to Beirut. And then from Beirut, they moved to London and then Oxford in the late 40s, in 49. And uh, Walid um, held a professorship uh, 
at Oxford. They stayed in Oxford until 1956 when Walid Khalidi resigned from that professorship in protest against uh, the tripartite aggression, the 56 uh, mm. Sinai war, which was an aggression by the former mandate powers, British, Britain, and France, alongside Israel. So uh, this is when Walid Khalidi and Rasha Salam came back to Beirut, and this is when he joined AUB, yeah. when he became a professor in political studies at AUB, and then later in uh, the early 60s, he co-founded the Institute for Palestine Studies. Yeah. I was reading about Walid Khadi earlier, and when I saw that resignation, I thought, okay, the guts on somebody like this, right? Um, and I was wondering if it was done in collaboration or in coordination with anyone else. Was he the only one standing up and walking out of these prestigious institutions saying, this is ridiculous, I'm not going to be a part of this? Um, was he the only one, or were other people doing that as well? Uh, good question. Uh, to my knowledge, he was the only one, but this doesn't mean that he was the only one. Maybe yeah. there were others. But um, from what I know, um, he took that decision. It was his personal yeah. decision. And yes, I agree. I think it's a very uh, courageous decision. Yeah, yes. hugely courageous. Mm -hmm. To walk away from Oxford. Yeah. But he was at Oxford, right? Yes. Um, and to come to a local institution and say... I'll just do it here. Um, I think it's amazing. Um, I want to talk about the two women in this photo. Um, as you say in, in the prologue, the, the three men in this photo have reputations. They've all been members of intellectual public intellectual life. Um, and the women, because of the nature of society at that time, and maybe still society today, um, have not were maybe not encouraged, maybe there were an um, enormous number of roadblocks, but let's, let's learn a little more about who they were, what they were thinking about, working on, whether or not it um, met, public, uh, met the public as well. Thank you for that question. Yes, I think it's very important to point out that um, the women of that generation, um, certainly there are some exceptions, right? But very often we hear about the man and not the woman, right? And the men, as, as you pointed out, yes, they all gained uh, recognition as literary writers, as scholars, as intellectuals, as institution builders, and so on. And um, they all three um, left behind. Walid Khalidi is still alive, and he's, he's, he's still uh, writing and producing and uh, uh, doing research. Um, they, they all produced really important works, literary works, but also Walid Khalidi, scholarly works on Palestine, um, uh, really key works, um, like all that remains before the diaspora. These are titles, right, that, that are very, very well known, and also his articles are um, uh, really important, the fall of Haifa, and, and, and uh, I think also for the new, who are called the new Israeli historians who came to the fore in the 80s um, with access to declassified material in Israeli state archives. Uh, I think m uh, they, they were very much inspired also um, by his um, scholarship. Um, so yes, uh, the man gained recognition. Uh, the woman, very little is known about them because they did not step into uh, uh, public spotlight. And Sally Kassab is the only one I did not devote a chapter to her in my book because I felt I was I didn't I was not able to find enough material to really ground my stories in. Um, and I also think um, it's important to acknowledge, you know, these gaps and silences and not pretend that we can just, you know, fill all the gaps, yeah. right? There are some gaps uh, that cannot be filled. 
But I did find some information about her. I did reach out. So it's actually, I think, uh, you know, when you do research, you start reading um, material that you wouldn't think of before. So I started reading some uh, um, obituaries, right? And uh, it is through those that I came across the name of her son and I contacted him. And uh, then he, um, you know, shared with me what he knew about his mother's uh, 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 life in Jerusalem. But he was born later, right? He was born in Beirut in the 50s. So, uh, I mean, how much do we know about our parents when they were young, right? There's only so much. But he did, for example, share with me a drawing, which I also reproduced in, uh, in the book, uh, that she did. So obviously, she was very interested in art, in literature. Also, so I came across some pictures where she is, uh, photos of her, um, where we see her reading a book. Uh, uh, and, you know, the fact that she was friends with Jabra, with Wolfgang. Wolfgang and her were really known as a couple, Sally and Wolfgang, uh, in Jerusalem in the early 40s. So, um, Certainly, she was very interested in literature and art, but then later, she she didn't um, uh, pursue these uh, interests. Now, uh, Russia, also for various reasons, um, did not step into public uh, spotlight, but she did write her memoirs. But as I said earlier, they remain unpublished. And she is the one who, in the 80s, so 40 years after they had met in Jerusalem, reached out to Wolfgang and started a correspondence with him. So maybe here I should add that in Jerusalem, she, she, she was very fond of Wolfgang. Uh, she had a crush on him. I mean, it's, it's uh, very nice, actually. In uh, Walid Khalidi, there's an article he wrote about Albert Hurani, where he very briefly refers to this group of friends. And I think where he also says something like they all had a crush on each other. You know, the 40s, um, early 40s in Jerusalem for at least their kind of social circle. It was, I think, a very open time. Jerusalem also very often, and here maybe we can move a bit to talk more about the city, is described as a cosmopolitan city. Yeah. Now, that's a term that is sometimes you know, used kind of uh, in, in general terms. I think we have to distinguish also between you know, different cosmopolitanism. Certainly, as I said earlier, this was an intellectual elite, right? So their cosmopolitanism was a cosmopolitanism of affluence, right? Different from, say, a cosmopolitanism of the poor, right? But especially also during the war years, there were so many different people coming together in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was a very vibrant city, and it was a city that was not yet uh, divided into east and west like other cities uh, in the region, it was divided into an old city, right? The holy city, and then the new city, right? So the expansion of the old city. So where the families who had the means would, you know, build their houses, their villas, and so on in the new city. So you had a range of new neighborhoods. Um, And as Salim Tamari, he has a very uh, nice book on Jerusalem before 1948. Um, He says that this city, so this Jerusalem, which was an ordinary city, like any other city, if you want, right? Um, That this city, it's, development was really cut short in 48. 
Yeah. And uh, this city today is almost forgotten because it's very difficult even to kind of reconstruct, right, uh, mentally uh, uh, what that city looked like. And certainly there have been a lot of attempts uh, uh, from the Israeli side to erase traces of that city. So I have a question about the, the impossibility of this friendship um, at the time. So in the 40s, um, would there have been a sense that this was also impossible at the time? I mean, I'm imagining in Beirut today, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if there was five intellectuals, one of whom is, you know, um, a... British, uh, Romanian person who's here, who's doing their PhD at AUB, and then there is somebody who's Druze, and there's somebody who's uh, Shia, and there's somebody who's uh, Egyptian, and there's somebody who's Iraqi, and there's somebody who's Sunni, and uh, Christian, and whatever, whatever version of that collection. If they were from an artistic background, they had very clear overlapping interests, I don't think anyone would say this is an impossible friendship at the, here today in Beirut. Um, did they think this was, oh my God, we are breaking the rules. This is crazy that we're all friends. Um, and did other people think so mm -hmm. at the time? That's a really good question. Um, so I think their friendship came, you know, it came very late in the British mandate, yeah. right? So we are talking, they met probably, as I said, fall 43, and then they became very, very close fast and remained close until 46, right? So that's um, three years and then stayed in touch through letters um, partly later. Um, so I think their friendship came at a time when, yes, such friendship was becoming impossible and was becoming quite rare because um, um, certainly you had, because really of all the violence, right? Terrorist attacks and, and, and but also the political uh, uh, violence, but also because of ideologies, right? Which really, um, you know, ideologies that, um, that do not, that really are against diversity, right? So the, Zionism, but also um, uh, Arab nationalisms. So um, ideologies of one people, one religion, one language, right? So um, yes, I think their friendship came at a time when such friendship was already becoming difficult. Actually, I talked about this with um, Walid Khalidi, and he distinguished between the generation before 1917 and the generation after. Mm. So before Balfour and after. And I think that makes a lot of sense. So when we look at the generation of his father, Ahmad Sameh Al Khalidi, he says that generation friendship was more common right? Um, for example, his father was friends with Judah Magnus, who was the president of the Hebrew University. It makes complete sense. They were colleagues, yeah. right, of the highest educational institutions, one the highest Jewish, the other the highest Palestinian Arab educational institution. But nothing has been written about this friendship. So also when you look at biographies of Magnus, the name Ahmad Sameh Khalidi does not even appear. And this is because we've always read Palestinian history as separate from Israeli history and vice versa, whereas we should really read them together, 
right? And also see how entangled these histories were. Also, I did some interviews with one of Walid's classmates, uh, Suhail Boulos, um, who's turning 100 years uh, this year, um, who um, worked as a medical doctor here at AUBMC. Uh, and uh, he also recalled in these interviews that they had some Jewish friends at schools, and these were, you know, uh, Arab Jews, right? Well, this is so, but they did, so just to finish this, yeah. but their generation already had less contact with the Yishuv with what became the Yishuv, the Jewish community in Palestine, than the previous generation. The immigrant and community. Yes, yeah. yes. And this has to do certainly with politics yeah. and with really the Zionist movement and... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, this is one of the things, like this Magnus character, who I'd, I have never heard of uh, just because of my own yeah. lack of information. Um, was he a European Jew that had moved to Israel? Uh, no, uh, Judah Magnus was an American Jew okay. who uh, moved to Palestine. Yeah. And then he became the first president of the Hebrew University. And then actually he moved back to New York in 1948 and uh, very much, he was very much in favor of a binational state. And um, he wrote, uh, he published articles and he tried to lobby uh, uh, for what he called a United States of Palestine, yeah. right? Today that sounds like science fiction, right? And at the time he was friends also with Hannah Arendt. Uh, he gave that uh, uh, article also to Hannah Arendt uh, to read. Uh, unfortunately, Yuda Magnus uh, passed away. Uh, he had a heart attack and, and he died in 1948. Wow. So um, we, we don't know how his positions would have developed, what he would have been able to do uh, uh, had he remained alive, uh, we don't know. Um, but I think it's very important also to tell these stories of um, such friendships because I think they can provide us with, you know, maybe not hope, but maybe glimpses of hope, right? And I think it's very important to understand that these friendships were possible. And I think they always are. I mean, even today, right, despite the wall, right, we still have people break these barriers and work together and become friends, despite yeah. all the violence we see today. Right. Uh, so I think this idea of one, you know, one language, one religion is doomed to fail. Uh, it's um, it's maybe similar to the idea of monolingualism. I mean, most people are bi or multilingual. Monolingualism is more or less an invention, you know, that came into existence with nationalism. Um, so, yes, I think maybe human nature that people do, you know, make friendships across borders and uh, despite war and despite conflict yeah. and despite also sometimes political differences, I think um, that can give us some hope. And we need some hope to hold on to something, right? Okay, so the uh, book can be found pretty much anywhere. It came out on Columbia University Press. Sonia, thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.